This is one of the rarest timekeeping devices on Earth, a functioning time ball tower. So you might wonder, how does this thing keep the time? Well, it's all got to do with that ball. Every year in Times Square, around a million of people gather to watch the dropping of the ball that happens precisely at midnight to welcome in the new year. This is seen by tens of millions of people around the world on their telly. And this operates in functionally the same way. This one's not as glitzy, it's not as glamorous. The one in New York weighs 500 kilos, has got 10,000 LEDs and is made of crystal. Well, this is a bit more functional, but it essentially does the same thing. And that is let people know a pre-designated time. Now you might be familiar with this in your own cities or towns. Essentially that's the equivalent of a bell ringing at a certain time of day. Now you might wonder, who is this trying to talk to? Because we are not in a town, we are on the coast. And the answer is the ships at sea. So why do ships care so much about the time? Well it all has to do with navigation. Essentially time is key in understanding your longitude and your latitude and they needed to update their marine chronometers. Every day just before 1 p.m. the ball is raised. Now in the past it was raised to half mast to let the ships know and to prepare. And at exactly 1 p.m. the ball is dropped, letting everyone know the exact time. Simple, right? Now here's the thing, with something so simple, this place has a long history and quite a journey to get here. So I mentioned that it kind of looks like a lighthouse and that's how it started its life, back in 1849. Now the building itself is made of local bluestone and there was also a wooden lighthouse keeper's accommodation built at the same time. Now in its early life when it was used as a lighthouse, there actually was a time ball being used. In this case it was a canvas ball that was raised and lowered manually on a nearby flagpole. Now the ball drop isn't actually the only way that this site shared the time with nearby ships. In fact there were reports that this wasn't quite visible enough so what they started to do was do a version at night. Now what would happen is they would use the lighthouse light. Now generally this was fixed, it was always on, and then what would happen is it would be eclipsed at 7.58 to let ships know that it was coming. Then at exactly 8 p.m. the light was exposed, and people would know the time with certainty. This tower had a pretty short life as a lighthouse. What happened was a floating light ship was anchored just further out to sea. So when this finished its life as a lighthouse, the time ball was installed on top of the tower. And for decades, every day at 1 p.m., the ball was dropped and could be used to set the clock. So this started as a manual process. It became electric, integrated into the nearby telegraph system. And what that meant is all the time balls in Williamstown, in Melbourne, in Geelong could be released simultaneously. And it was done within less than 1 1 20th of a second of error. The time ball was dropped for decades until the 1920s. And for 37 years, it was one timekeeper who was responsible for this, a retired able seaman, R.T. Vaughan. Now he really single-handedly kept this going until he tragically passed away from pneumonia. And it wasn't that long after that it was decided it really wasn't being used that much and the time ball would stop. So what killed the need for time balls? Essentially, technological progress. With GPS, you get incredibly accurate signals from satellite dishes that are flying around the Earth. Once you've got enough signals, you can get your latitude, your longitude, your altitude, and the precise time. And that makes this unnecessary. So why does it continue to function? Well, the story of this tower is pretty interesting. It started its life as a lighthouse. It then became a time ball tower. And once it retired from that, it got reinstated as a lighthouse. Its height was raised, a bulb was put in that could be seen for around 25 nautical miles. And that operated and continued until the 1980s. Now in the 1980s, a different decision was made, and that was that we should restore this as a time ball tower. You might wonder why. Well, it certainly wasn't for functional reasons. Instead, a local rotary group thought that this is an important part of Australia's history, and they should be used not necessarily to tell ships out at sea what the time is, but to show what this technology was and its importance. So my name is Claire. I'm a ranger at Parks Victoria. Um, and we manage Point Dillybrand Coastal Heritage Park, which is where we are. And that's home to the Time Ball Tower. And your role at Parks Vic is, and what does it involve? Our team manage a lot of the on-water stuff. So piers and jetties, navigation aids, as well as marine sanctuaries. And we have a few uh, land passes as well. And had you ever heard of a Time Ball Tower before this one? Um, so I grew up in Williamstown. Yeah. Um, so we've been learning about yeah. the Williamstown Time Ball Tower since I was a little kid. So you've seen this as a kid, an important part of Williamstown, and now you're responsible for maintaining it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's That's pretty, really cool. Pretty special place. So this is the controller. It determines when the ball goes up and down, and yeah, it keeps track of the time. Look at that. It is such a digital piece of technology controlling such an analog device. It's got the time, it's got the date, 
And that's pretty much it. Do you need to do any kind of maintenance on this or what's kind of the, yeah, your involvement with it? We do. So we manually change the time every daylight savings. So we come up here and set the clock. This is the top of the Time Vault Tower. You can see that right above our heads is where the kind of magic happens every day at one o'clock. This is the cable. This is the kind of piece that does everything it needs to do, winching it up and releasing it. Uh, we've got some of the historic uh, equipment still up here. One of the main design features is of course the height. So high enough that it can be seen from ships off the coast um, and hopefully you can see it in good weather as well. So in one sense, it's a fairly simple, elegant and quite you know, straightforward design. And in one sense, so incredibly important. It's, I think, something that everyone should see in Melbourne. I think it's a little, it's sort of world kept secret. They should come down, watch it drop at one and enjoy the park that it's in as well. So I love the history of this entire place, but there's also history recorded in small details. So if you look at these stones, for example, you can see that there are holes in each of them. Now this is actually used from the quarrying and moving process so they could lift them up on winches. I also love this arrow right here pointing to this point. This is a survey marker. So this point is known by surveyors with incredible precision, and this can be used for nearby properties to make measurements and find the exact boundaries. Now in researching this, I came across this article in 1928 that said, a lot of young people wouldn't know about this technology, they probably hadn't seen it in action, and that this should be considered part of history. And a hundred years later, I think both of those things are still true. So these days, the site is open to the public. If you want to come down and watch the ball fall every day at one o'clock, there's even a local ghost tour which will take you inside. And you can do it, you can come down, you can check your watch to make sure it's right, or just enjoy a piece of history. My name's Julian O'Shea, and this is Unknown Australia.